Hello, in this video we're going to cover another classic bit of engineering theory, the stress-strain curve. So in an engineering textbook, you will quite often see a graph that looks something like this. Which is all very well and good, but what on earth does it mean? So this is a stress-strain curve. It's a plot of when a material is stretched, so put under a tensile force, um, the, the proper name for stretching, and we plot the, the stress, which is a fancy word for pressure, against the strain, which is a fancy word for extension. And for a ductile material, very often, you'll get a curve that looks something like this. And this is a classic curve that's in all kinds of engineering textbooks. If you do tensile testing on a variety of metals, you'll see something very similar to this. Um, so let's take a look what all these things mean. So first off, just remember this is effectively how hard, how, with how much force you're stretching, and this is how much the thing has stretched. So the first part of the graph is known as the elastic region. So this bit here is the elastic region. And the definition of something being elastic is that when you stretch it exactly 10 millimeters, you let go, it'll go back to zero. Not one, it hasn't deformed plastically, which means if you stretch it 10 millimeters, it might go back to one millimeter. So it's had a permanent deformation. So in the elastic region, you stretch it and it goes exactly back to its starting position onto this next section of the curve, which is known as the plastic region. And in the plastic region, the material has gone past its elastic limit and it's permanently deformed. I'm sure you've all taken a paper clip and if you spring it very lightly, it will spring back. You're working within the elastic limit there. The second that you pull it far enough apart, that it stays where it is, you're very much into the plastic region. So plasticity is, can be used interchangeable with uh, ductility or malleability. And if something's deformed plastically, it's deformed forever. It's not gonna go back to exactly how it was. So let's have a look at some other points. So as we increase the pulling force, we get in an extension. And we're gonna look at these two terms in some depth in a second. Eventually, when you pull it, it makes sense that it will fracture. And that's what this is. This is the fracture point. And if we look carefully at the graph, we'll find that the maximum point on the graph in the stress region is up here. That is the highest point on the stress axis. And it's actually in the plastic region, and that's what's known as the UTS. So this point here is the ultimate tensile strength. Ultimate tensile strength. Okay. Here, around here, this point, that's the elastic limit, which makes sense. It's at the point where you cannot stretch anymore before it starts deforming plastically. So elastic limit. And shortly after that point is the yield point. It's where the material gives up the ghost. So at the yield point, it becomes plastic. The material has given up and will never go back to how it was. Now, there's all kinds of funky stuff you can do with these graphs. So if you were to work out the area underneath the graph, then you can find out the strain energy and then ultimately the work done in stretching this, uh, this material, whatever it is. But the one that we're interested in at this level, of course, is the gradient of this section. And the gradient is given by stress over strain. And that, the gradient of the section here, is known as the Young's modulus. The Young's modulus is basically a measure of stiffness um, of the material. So Formula One cars and other high performance um, racing cars use carbon fibre, not only because it's very light, but it also has a very high Young's modulus. It's very rigid, so the, the car isn't flopping around when it's going into corners. So Young's modulus is a key term that we're going to investigate in a second now. So I'm going to rub this off the board. We'll have a look at some key formulae. Okay, so we've, we now know what's going in the, uh, the stress-strain curve. We need to be able to work out some calculations. So, key 
letters and um, and factors that we're going to look at in, in here. So we've already talked about stress being on the y-axis. So stress is given by the Greek letter sigma. And the formula for stress is force divided by area. And you might notice that is exactly the same formula as pressure. And it's the same units too. So force measured in newtons, area is measured in meters squared, so newtons per meter squared. However, in engineering applications, it's more common to give the stress or pressure in Pascal. So one Pascal is the same as one newton per meter squared. So quite often we'll use Pascal. And in engineering materials, things like aluminum, steel, and brass, we're working in the region of megapascals or gigapascals. Just a point of uh, reference, a megapascal is equal to one times 10 to the six pascals. A gigapascal is one times 10 to the nine. In other words, one with 10 nines after it. Next factor that we need to think about is strain. Strain given by the Greek letter epsilon, which is sort of like a back to front three. Um, that is given by the change in length, delta L, Wherever you see a delta symbol, nine times out of 10, it will mean change in, change in length over the original length. This value has no units. If we do a unit analysis quickly, length, change in length measured in meters, original length measured in meters, they cancel. There are no units. It's just a percentage increase and typically be a very small number. It is a unitless quantity. Finally, we're going to come on to the Young's modulus, which is a measure of stiffness of the material. So that is given by so Young's mod. Stiffness is given by E, which is the gradient of this section, remember. And E is given by stress over strain. Now, from basic high school maths, you remember when you've got a straight line graph, you work at the gradient of that by calculating the change in y over the change in x. So just to illustrate that, we're gonna do two separate examples. Right, two lines there. It's clear that this has got a greater gradient than this. So let's quickly do it. Change in y for line one. It's gonna be the change in y So in this case, it goes three for every 1.5 along, which is equal to two. And for this one, we've got a change in one for one. So for line two, it goes one unit up and one unit along. So that's got a gradient of one. Exactly the same is the case. So instead of using change in Y, which happens to be stress, and change in X, which happens to be Epsilon or strain, we've got Young's modulus is stress over strain. That's just something you need to remember. And that is going to be measured typically in megapascals. So these are our three important formulae for working out on stress strain curves. However, I know some of you still aren't totally happy with rearranging uh, formulas. So let's just do some simple um, formula triangles. There we have it. That might be helpful to, uh, to make a note of. Just remember, all you do, if you want to work out the area here, cover up the thing you want to find out and you'll have force divided by stress in that case. Talking of area, it's worth just looking at um, some basic area calculations because you're going to need some of those in the working out some of these problems. Okay, typically the sections of samples that we're going to be using in tensile tests are going to be in two forms. The first is going to be some kind of rectangle and I really hope that you'll be able to work out the area of that. You'll have a length, You'll have a width, we'll call it a breadth and a width. The area is obviously breadth times width. Remember to work in SI units, you're gonna be working in meters, not millimeters or centimeters or kilometers, work in meters. So if that means converting it first, convert it. Typically the other sections that you will uh, come across in tensile testing, there's these little machined samples. So that's gonna be given by area is equal to pi r squared, where r is the 
radius of the cross-sectional area. So just remember, use those two when you're doing your stress calculations for this section here.